Hi, my name is Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and I'm here tonight with Dr. Jonathan Howard. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Howard. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Dr. Howard is a neurologist and psychiatrist at NYU and Bellevue Hospital. He is the director of neurology at Bellevue and the coordinator of the neurology clerkship. He received his medical degree from the University of Southern California and completed his residency in neurology and psychiatry, as well as a fellowship in multiple sclerosis at New York University. He is also the author of a recent 2019 book, Cognitive Errors and Diagnostic Mistakes, a case-based guide on critical thinking in medicine, which I read in its 400 page plus entirety. And the basic concept is everyone makes mistakes, even doctors, we're all human. Part of being a good doctor is to be aware of this and to work hard to think clearly and critically to make the best decisions for the patient. It's important to be aware of the many what I call thinking traps called cognitive biases and fallacies that can lead to errors. But it's not just doctors who make thinking errors. Patients or parents, if you're a pediatrician, can do so too. And today we're using, a lot of times we're using more of a shared decision making. It's not like doctor knows best. People come in and they have their ideas and they can discuss it with the doctor. So I think it's really, really important for the patient parent to be empowered to be able to think as clearly as possible. And Dr. Howard, I would love for you to talk a little bit about that, please. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, when it comes to thinking clearly, it can be uh, very difficult to do. We all have our own predispositions, our own upbringing, our own background, and this can lead to cognitive biases and cognitive errors. Um, importantly, cognitive biases are not necessarily bad in and of themselves. Um, cognitive biases are kind of the mental shortcuts that we all use all the time in order to navigate our everyday lives. Not every decision that we make needs or, or you know, can be done um, with great thought and great care, or we'd never get dressed and leave the house every morning. We do so many things automatically. Right. And this serves us well most of the time. We manage to get up and out of the house pretty much every day, I hope. But it can lead to flaws and it can lead to errors at times. And at times, those can have significant consequences. Mm -hmm. So can you give me an example of that, please? Sure. I mean, I think one of the most important things has to deal with risk perception. Mm -hmm. And people are sometimes very good at, 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 at uh, being scared of things that we should be uh, scared of. But other times we are very scared of things that are safe and very comfortable with things that are dangerous. And probably nothing better illustrates this than the fact that there are many people who are afraid to fly. Right. And flying is thankfully generally very, very, very safe. In contrast, you probably won't meet anyone um, who is afraid of driving. Aside from me, I'm actually... <laughs> actually, I am too. This maybe was such a great example. All right. But, uh, but, but really, the risks, the risks of driving are greater than the risks of flying. And the sure. typical person, maybe not us, but the typical person yeah. fears flying more than driving. Correct. And, 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 and most people are so comfortable with driving that, in fact, one of the leading causes of car crashes is people falling asleep at the wheel. Mm. That's how relaxed they are texting, right. as they travel, or texting, yeah, as they travel down a highway, sometimes with their kids in the car going 75 miles an hour. Um, in contrast, especially people who haven't flown before, you know, they're gripping the seat and, and they're terrified. But statistically, flying is much safer, excuse me, much, uh, yeah, no, I said it right, flying is much safer uh, right. than driving. So we're often afraid of things that are safe and comfortable with things that are dangerous. So I would love to use this chance to bring up the flu shot. And I will have to start by saying, I will have to admit that it is not our most effective shot. And I tell this to patients all the time. It is not as effective as we like. However, it is very safe. So I would love to go through some of the things that my families tell me when they turn down the flu shot and get your input on what's going on with their risk analysis here. Sure. I would only say that you're not, um, I, I would say you don't have to admit uh, that it's not the most effective vaccine. You know, you're just doing what doctors should do, telling the straight out facts. Right. That, you know, the flu vaccine varies in efficacy from year to year. I'm sure you sort of have a speech that you give. And mm -hmm. I think we're used to vaccines being 99% effective, that anything less than that feels like zero. Right. 
Right, and I tell people that even if it's 50% effective, I have a colleague who's a pediatric emergency room doctor, and she says, here's your choice. You're standing on a firing squad. You can stand on that firing squad without any protection, or I'll give you a Kevlar vest that will cover about half your body. Isn't that an obvious choice? You will take the Kevlar vest, even though it's not perfect. Yes, you would prefer a Kevlar vest. You would prefer not to be on the firing squad. But <laughs> in this analogy, the point is, and people get it when you tell them, for the most part. However, I still hear people say, I'm going to go through them. Um, one thing I hear commonly is, oh, uh, two years ago, I got the flu shot, and then I got the flu that year. And then last year, I skipped my flu shot, and I didn't get the flu. And so, sure. therefore, I'm not getting the flu shot this year. So this, this is a very sort of common cognitive bias is that things that happen to us personally take on much, much, much greater weight than perhaps what the science actually mm -hmm. shows. So I have no doubt that there are people who get the flu shot and get the flu, as we discussed. Um, it's not the best vaccine. But what the science shows is that the flu vaccine, as we discussed, varies from year to year, but it tends to, people who get it tend to have uh, the flu less often, or if they get it, have milder cases of the flu. And the mistake that people make is to think that what's true for them personally means it's going to be true for their, you know, that one year um, is going to be true for everyone always, or it's going to be true for them always. I mean, I can tell you stories about myself. I was crossing the street a couple of years ago um, uh, in, in Midtown, and I looked down, and there was a $20 bill. Mm -hmm. Great. Does that mean that I now advise people to go to this particular street corner because they can find money? Of course not. It was a, a random fluke. Um, and I don't pretend that my experience at that moment at that street corner is going to generalize and be true for everyone else. Or even for me, I don't go back, back to that street corner looking for money. Right, right. Here's another thing I hear. I never get the flu shot because I never get the flu because I wash my hands and I take a multivitamin and I live a very healthy lifestyle. I only eat organic food, so on and so forth. Yeah. What so say about that? Washing your hands is great. Leading a healthy lifestyle is great. It, doesn't make you invulnerable and in, invincible to infectious diseases, unfortunately. Um, people want to feel that they have a sense of control mm -hmm. about their health and that if they just obey the right rules and um, that nothing bad is going to happen to them. And yeah, you can certainly put the odds in your favor, right? Um, and you should. You should eat healthy. You should try to get some exercise and, and not smoke. But it doesn't make you invincible and it doesn't make you invulnerable, unfortunately. Right, right. Um, here's another thing I hear. Um, I don't want to get the flu shot because it doesn't work a lot of the time. And we talked a little bit about how it's not the most effective vaccine, but it is very safe. But what would you say about somebody who's saying, I don't want it if it's not perfect? Yeah, so there's a formal name for that error in thinking called the nirvana fallacy. Mm -hmm. Just that, for, if, that if something doesn't work 100% of the time, it's not worth using. And this is, goes back to what I was saying before about the, how people are bad sometimes at judging risks, is that there's nothing, virtually nothing in the world uh, that is going to protect you 100% of the time. Smoke detectors aren't perfect. I have one. Um, seat belts aren't right. <laughs> I wear one. And in fact, seat belts can cause injury. I have seen, I don't work a lot with trauma, um, but, but I've seen photographs of people who've been horribly injured by seatbelts. Had they not been wearing the seatbelt, they absolutely would have been dead. Um, so it's just a question of risk benefit that way. When I said I ride my bike throughout New York City, and when I ride my bike, I wear my helmet. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make me invincible, unfortunately. Right. Uh, I could still get hurt, but if I'm unfortunate enough to get in a crash, I'd rather be wearing a helmet than not. So life is full of things that keep us safe but aren't perfect. Right, that is correct. Um, another thing I hear is, mm, I don't know, I'm not sure. You know what? I, I'd rather do nothing. I'd rather make the decision to do nothing because you know what? If I do the shot and something happens to my child, I'll never forgive myself. So I'm going to do nothing. Yeah, so that's so doing nothing is doing something, I, I think, um, and it's easy to see why why people feel that way. I suppose um, it's the idea that 
the flu is, is, is sort of natural. And, you know, if, if, if my child or myself contracts that there was some sort of sense of fate about that, that it was meant to be. And I think that this is, this is uh, you know, a very common way for people, myself included, to think. As a doctor, for example, if my patient's disease takes a bad turn, mm-hmm. I feel bad. I, I don't like it, but I don't feel guilty. I don't feel responsible. I don't feel like I did something wrong. On the other hand, if a patient has a reaction to a medication that I've given them, I feel bad for the patient. I feel horrible. I feel guilty. But that's not always the right thing to do or the right way to feel. A a, a bad outcome is a bad outcome, whether you caused it yourself or you failed to prevent it. So I think that the best way to try to think about these things, again, is is to use the science as hard as that is. And what do the numbers actually show? And the numbers actually show that the flu vaccine is much, 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 much more likely to protect you right. than it is to uh, harm you. And one thing that I think is also true about the flu, maybe you're going to bring this up, I don't know, is, is that people don't have a good sense of what it is because they call every cold and every sniffle right. the flu. And when you've seen people hospitalized for the flu, you know that the flu is not the cold. It's not a cold. It's not the sniffles and the sore throat for a couple of days. Um, the, the flu can be a real big deal. And I, I think because the flu, and I've, I've read some article recently that people maybe tried to, are trying to change the name because it doesn't sound that serious. It doesn't sound like polio and diphtheria and smallpox. Um, but because people have this misconception that the flu is just a couple of days, you know, at home with the sniffles, people don't, take it as seriously as maybe they should. Mm -hmm. That reminds me that also people sometimes say, sorry, that I got the flu from the flu shot last year. I'm not going to get the flu shot this year because last year I got the flu shot and it gave me the flu. Yeah. So that's basically impossible. I shouldn't even say basically impossible. That, that, that is impossible. Um, And it, 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 you know, people have this very, common sense that that uh you know when you eat something you know you are what you eat or even maybe more so if you inject it but the flu vaccine is not live it's an, it's impossible to get it from uh from the flu vaccine and this goes back to the very first vaccine about 225 years there were cartoons um the first vaccine was the uh smallpox vaccine by edward jenner uh in england and it it the smallpox vaccine came from cows originally, and people thought it, that getting this vaccine would turn them into cows. I think they literally thought that there were cartoons of people. Yeah, I've seen them. Horns. Yeah. You know, and we sort of laugh about this today. You know, how could people think this? You know, people can't change into cows. But it, it taps into something very deep within us that, again, I'm going to repeat myself, that you are what you eat or that if something is injected into you, it can, you can become it, um, but it's, it's, it's impossible to get the flu from the flu shot. You're giving me a great segue to fear of needles. <laughs> I, I think that what I want, wanted also to talk about is what happens when we're afraid, how we think when we're afraid, as opposed to how we think when we're more calm and rational. Yeah. No, I mean, fear is, is not a good place to be making wise decisions i you know no one likes needles Uh, you know that's that's you're you're crazy if you like needles uh for the most part uh so so fear of needles if someone out there is listening is afraid of needles yeah uh that's that's of course normal but there's it's an uncomfortable spot and there's a sense that your body is being violated in ways that it normally isn't and the flu shot because it triggers an immune reaction can give you a sore arm and it, it you know can make people feel a little sick for a few days and i can understand why some people fear it and, and, and wonder, um, you know, why they're getting it, especially if they have the misconception that a flu is just, just, uh, just a, a, a childhood mild illness. Yeah, exactly right. And of course, and again, maybe this is something that you're going to bring up later too, but one of the reasons we get the flu shot is not just to protect ourselves. Right. Um, you know, I'm a pretty strong and vigorous guy. I think I could probably be okay with the flu, but of course, maybe not strong, vigorous guys, uh, you know, can really be damaged by this, but I live around people um, who are not strong and vigorous uh, all the time. And if I was to pass on the flu to 
someone like that to a, a neighbor, a relative, um, it would, I'd feel pretty rotten. Right. And the same is true for newborn babies. Those are also a high risk category. But even people who are healthy can and do die of the flu. There was recently a 40 year old, I think she was 40 year old mother in Israel, five children, 10 and under, perfectly healthy, to the best of my knowledge, who was not vaccinated, who died of the flu. Yeah. Very I sad. So it can happen to anyone. So again, when you talk about risk benefit analysis, a lot of times I think people will make an analysis, well, I'm healthy, this won't happen to me. It may be less likely, but it doesn't mean it's zero likely. Sure, sure. Nothing, not, there's nothing that keeps you completely safe. Right, and, and taking off from when you said about injections, I think another fear people have about injections is putting things into someone's body. It's kind of a, a purity thing. Um, and they'll say, I'm not getting the flu shot. And people said this to me, I'm not getting the flu shot because you know those bad things that are in it. Yeah, uh, th there's no question that the ingredients of flu vaccines or really any vaccine um, can be very scary if you just read them out full of sort of chemical formulas and, and complicated names. Um, but that's true of a lot of things. Um, water, of course, is hydrogen and uh, uh, the hydrogen and, and oxygen. And the formal chemical name for hydrogen is dihydrogen monoxide. Ooh, scary. <laughs> right, and you can say correctly, you know, dihydrogen monoxide kills thousands of people every year, which is sadly true because right. probably people drown in uh, tragedies like that. Um, but of course, dihydrogen monoxide is just water. And is water poisonous? Is water toxic? The Actually, in, in a certain, I don't mean to drop it, in a certain amount it is. That's exactly what I and was my, my, Oh, sorry to interrupt. You can go up. Sorry, go. Okay, that's okay. Um, it, <laughs> it is possible to drink an excessive amount of water, and that messes with your electrolytes, your chemical balance. And I have seen people get really, really, really sick. And it doesn't happen a lot, but I've heard right. of people dying uh, because they, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're told, you know, you're exercising on a hot dray, make sure you drink tons of water. And they do. And uh, they, they've drunken themselves to death. And importantly, scary chemical ingredients are everywhere. Mm -hmm. I saw this infographic on the, the natural chemical ingredients of a blueberry or mm -hmm. an egg. And if you just read the chemical names, you know, isoconic acid, uh, you know, it, it's full of really scary sounding ingredients. Right. Formaldehyde. It's in, Formaldehyde. It's in us. <laughs> You're correct. And this is one of the most important points of medicine. I'm sure you've heard this expression, the dose makes mm -hmm. poison. And what that means is everything is poisonous if you take too much of it. And nothing is poisonous if you take too little of it. And so the amount of these scary ingredients in vaccines, you know, yes, if you took a giant needle and loaded yourself up with them a million times over, could cause problems. The water itself <laughs> would be very dangerous right. and toxic. But in the minuscule amounts that these ingredients are present in vaccines, they are extremely safe. Right. And some people say, but I heard a doctor say the flu shot is bad. I heard it on, I don't know, I'm not going to mention a name, a doctor, yes, a so, famous doctor. Well, I feel very passionately about this. There are uh, a very small number of doctors who have become against vaccines. Um, but you can find a, a so-called expert to support just about any position. And so when evaluating the credentials of these doctors, and some of them have been very well trained, I, I knew a couple, believe it or not, um, I would ask the following questions. Is this person actively writing published scientific articles about vaccines? Because there are researchers who go to work every day in labs, in hospitals, who are really doing the science that is moving, you know, studying vaccines, um, moving vaccines forward and learning more about vaccines and, you know, teaching us about vaccines. And these are the true experts. That's number one. And number two, does this anti-vaccine doctor work in a hospital with sick people? And the answer to those questions is 
I don't even want to say almost always know. The answer is 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. And so these doctors are sort of blind to the problems that they cause because when a child, unvaccinated child comes in who's sick with the flu, they won't see them. They won't be there. You might be, I might be, I don't see too many kids, but um, you know, you get the point. So I, I, I see these people and, and, and they don't. Um, so I, I think that's very important. And, when, and, and a very important point too, is I just got done talking about vaccine researchers, is that when vaccines don't work, it's admitted. So just this week, I think on Monday, there was an announcement that a, another, this is not the first time, unfortunately, but a trial of an HIV vaccine failed. Mm -hmm. That's too bad. An HIV vaccine would be a wonderful thing for this mm -hmm. world, especially uh, in Africa, but it failed. And it was publicized. It got a lot of press. No one was trying to hide anything. And you will not be able to get this vaccine and no doctor will suggest it. So when vaccines fail, we admit that. It's not, it's not, there's no cover up. So why would a doctor say that though? Why would a doctor say that the flu shot is bad? So I'm a little mystified to that myself. I, I think there are a few doctors who have embraced sort of multiple conspiracy theories. Um, you know, these doctors, I've never met a, a doctor. And again, let's keep in mind, this is about 20 doctors in the entire country. Um, but they all sort of embrace multiple strange conspiracy theories about how the world works. Um, I think a lot of them, and I'm, this is sort of my armchair psychology here, mm -hmm. I think a lot of them feel very special, like that they know so much more than everyone else. That can be a good feeling mm -hmm. and if i may cast doubt on uh, some of their motives as well almost all of them are selling things mm. almost all of them have fancy websites with stores and pictures of themselves um in contrast you know i've never sold anything to a patient i don't have a store i've written a few medical textbooks that you uh, mentioned at the beginning which i don't think uh, anyone here is going to read i uh, did it's really good oh thank you um <laughs> But, but I, you know, in general, I'm not a household name. I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. Uh, I'm not making YouTube videos, and, and I don't have a big social media presence. And most doctors are like me. I'm, I'm nothing special. 99% of doctors are like me. But with the very, very, very few anti-vaccine doctors, they're much more comfortable giving speeches than they are in the hospital. And anyone who's more comfortable on a stage or in front of a camera than they are at the bedside of a sick patient, you may want to question, is this really someone from whom I should get medical advice? I think also that they're tapping into a growing distrust, mm -hmm. right? Including of big pharma, which is another thing I hear. I'm not getting the flu shot because big pharma. Yeah, so big pharma is not a perfect organization like any organization. It, it's full of, it, it has its flaws. But I think a very important to make point to make about vaccines is that they save an enormous amount of money. And anyone who has cared for a patient in the ICU, sick with the flu or any vaccine preventable disease, knows that within 10 minutes, uh, the, the care of this patient exceeds the cost of the flu vaccine. Um, and in hospitals, a dose of Tylenol can cost as much as the, the, the flu vaccine. Uh, and, and just imagine, just imagine how expensive it would be if there were no vaccines and measles came roaring back and pertussis and diphtheria and polio. Hospital wards would be filled and boy, we might be seeing this in, in, in with right. the corona. Okay, we're not, we're not gonna talk about that, okay. <laughs> Uh, but, but 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 that gives me a perfect segue into anxiety and fear and you know we and uncertainty and i really want to talk about how we can deal with uncertainty and deal with making these risk benefit analyses you know without certainty right because it would be easy like for example if somebody comes in and they have strep throat you're going to get an antibiotic that's straightforward but not all medicine is and i would, I would they, say Sorry to cut you off, I apologize now, but I would say uncertainty is, is a fundamental part of medicine because right. 
there's nothing. The only thing I think I can think of in medicine that is 100% guaranteed to work is getting enough sleep. I, I think that's about the only thing uh, that is that is absolutely perfect. But every medical intervention comes with some risk. Band aids. Some people can have very horrible skin reactions to band aids. Right. Um, uh, and and they're not perfect at stopping bleeding. So so everything comes with some risk and nothing is perfect. And if I can just make one real quick point, backtracking uh, about how much money vaccines save. Um, I don't know if you know this, if you've ever been to Roosevelt Island, it's here uh, right outside of where I work. I see it every day on the East River, but there, uh, there's a building there that kind of looks like an abandoned castle. It looks very much out of place um, as you're driving down the FDR. And what that building actually is, it's an old smallpox hospital. It's called Renwick Smallpox Hospital. Wow, smallpox, wow. And so and, and on Ellis Island, they used to have uh, whole measles wards. So vaccines, not only, in my opinion, do they rob big money of pharma, but they have closed entire hospitals. And not just here in New York City, there were smallpox hospitals throughout the world that are now in ruins are totally non-existent because of vaccines. So, and and, and I mean, to talk to you, but the smallpox vaccine put itself out of business. I'm like yeah. one of the last people to get the smallpox vaccine. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, no. It's, it's not the it's, scar, but we don't have it anymore because thank God we don't need it. I would love to get the MMR out of business too and get rid of those diseases. Yeah, absolutely. That there, There's no more uh, greater success than for a vaccine than to make itself irrelevant. We're so close with polio. Um, so that's but, a yeah, but I think we are a victim of our own success, right? Because we don't see what these diseases can do. Correct. And the good that a vaccine does is measured by bad things that don't happen. Mm -hmm. So no, no, no child comes home from school and says, hey, mom, guess what? Here are five diseases I didn't get today right. thanks to vaccines. And, you know, again, life is full of these things uh, that, that, you know, maybe someone will design a, a new traffic light or put a new traffic light up on a, on a on a busy intersection and it will prevent over the course of the year 10 car crashes which is great but no individual person is going to know that they were the one who was saved and so it, it's hard to appreciate the good that vaccines do until you go to a part of the world where they don't have vaccines or right. encounter a disease for which no vaccine has been developed yet right it's true and also, you never hear the story of, I had a shot and nothing happened. My child had a vaccine and nothing happened. Correct. And, that, you know, the, the, I've never seen a news story, you know, plain way and safely at JFK. Right. So. Right. So we hear, and now that we have the internet and, and all kinds of media, we hear about things from all over all corners of the world, which we didn't used to hear about. We would hear about what happened locally. Now we hear globally. Correct. And these, these stories are often much, this is, might be another bias, is that these stories are, are very, very persuasive to us in a way that dry mm -hmm. statistics are not. So hearing the story, and I'm not suggesting that they're fabricated, although a, a handful of them are, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of a child getting a vaccine, and then at some point later, something bad happening to that child, that tugs at our heartstrings and it appeals to us at a very emotional level. And given that there's, I think, 4 million children born every year in the United States, uh, you know, some huge number, and, you know, they each get several vaccines throughout the year. Just by chance alone, something bad is going to happen to a child shortly after getting a vaccine. And those emotional stories, for better or for worse, are much, much more persuasive than a sort of dry, boring scientific study of you know, 99 percent of people who got this shot had this reaction. It just doesn't appeal to us on an emotional level. And that's how we make decisions, for better or for worse, is through emotion a lot of times. So that's a great segue to how can we make better decisions knowing that we have this tendency when there's uncertainty to be more fearful and not think as clearly and i actually found an article it's called 11 ways emotionally intelligent people overcome uncertainty and i just want to go through um not all 11 <laughs> but a couple of them so the first one was that they 
don't have a knee-jerk response. They don't make a decision right away when they realize that there's this fear reaction. They stop and they take a, a deep breath. They think with their head and not with their fear, the, the logical part of their head, not with the fear part of their head. So that's one thing that they do. Um, another thing, and, and, and it's also important to know that sometimes you do have things to be afraid of. You do have to be cautious, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to be alert, but not anxious. Another thing that's recommended is to be positive. I've had people say to me, if there's a possible reaction to the vaccine, my kid's going to get it. And that is the opposite way of the way you should be thinking. We should be thinking more rationally and more positively. Um, another thing that wasn't in this article, but I, I came up somewhere else that maybe you have some comments on is, don't let yourself be overly influenced by others. Well, I suppose it depends on, on, on who's doing the influencing mm -hmm. for you. Um, you know, we all have to let ourselves be influenced by others a lot of times because we can't be experts in everything. So, right. you know, when I go to get my bike fixed, I hand it over to the guy and I say, you do what you need to do. And, you know, I'm trusting that, you know, when I start going really fast, the wheel isn't going to fall off. Uh, when I take a taxi, I trust that the person driving it hopefully is a good driver and is sober and this sort of thing. So we, we, we do have to, to be influenced and put our trust in other people um, at, at times. And I think pediatricians like yourself are, are hopefully um, who most people listening to this will choose to trust in that um, you've studied this stuff for a lot of years and you have a lot of experience and you have, when you're seeing a child, you have that child's best interest at heart, that you are not getting paid secretly under the table to give the flu vaccine, for not example. A penny. <laughs> not a penny. Not a penny. Exactly right. And so I, I, I do think people need to, to learn how to trust. And one of the problems with vaccine rejection is just that there's almost too much doubt, I, I think, that, that people doubt everything that they hear and, and 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 that can be a problem so you do need to learn to, to trust a little bit again just like you do when you you know go in a taxi or eat food at someone else's house you trust that they have clean cleansed it or you know washed it properly and they're not trying to poison you in some way uh hopefully not right. uh you know so 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 there there is a decent amount of trust that has to be involved that that most people are good and they're out to try to help you right and also that it's good to understand that people aren't perfect like i've had people say oh well this doctor makes mistakes therefore i can't trust this doctor we all make mistakes we're all not perfect only god is perfect Absolutely. So our full trust is only in God, but there has to be some level of trust. Like you said, it's it's not wrong to be skeptical and it's not wrong to be alert of possible risks, right? I mean, I'm happy to talk to people who have concerns, yeah. but if they can't trust me at all, I can't get anywhere. And I do have people say that to me. I trust you. I trust you. Whatever you say, up. And then when it comes to vaccines, they won't. So... I think you made a really good point about all the training that we go through and hopefully we're able to have relationships. Yeah, and I think it's, 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 it's to fine to ask. Earn the trust. Yeah, right. It, it, it's, it's great to ask questions. Um, what I've seen certain people do, though, is, is kind of start with the answer and then, ask, then pretend to ask questions, I, I, right. I suppose. Um, so asking questions is great, but only if you're really willing to hear the answer. And nothing, and I, I mean this very literally, nothing has been studied more than vaccines. There have been more studies on vaccines than any topic in medicine. Vaccines are the oldest medical treatment, I, I think, uh, still in existence, uh, 225 years old. And vaccines have been used around the world. Every single country, from New Zealand to North Korea to Iceland, uses vaccines. And the idea that there would be some sort of global conspiracy, I, I think is a little bit implausible, uh, that involves every single government, every single doctor around the world is keeping some sort of secret. Uh, you know, when, when secrets are very hard to keep, uh, I think is, is, is hard, a little far-fetched. 
what I find is that there's only a small percentage of people that are conspiracy theory vaccine hesitant types. And that there's a much larger group of people who are just scared. Mm -hmm. So they're not thinking there's a major conspiracy, but they're scared. And I think that there's a very strong desire to be in control. And the last piece I'm going to end with is from the same article about 11 ways emotionally intelligent people overcome uncertainty is they embrace that which they can't control. And from a religious perspective, we believe that God Hashem is the true doctor and that we physicians are just the shalichim, we are just the, the messengers. And that I want to end with, with a, a prayer that we are worthy messengers of God and that everybody who listens is able to find the appropriate shaliach, the appropriate physician to be that messenger for God. And I want to thank you so, so much, Dr. Howard, for talking to me about this very important topic tonight. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on and I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank, thank you. Have a good night.